Okay, folks, quick definition. Tokusatsu is the Japanese term for special effects photography. It's generally used in the fandom community to mean anything involving uh, giant rubber monsters, superheroes, and uh, programs of that nature. It's been super influential outside of Japan as well. Um, I'm gonna start with an example from Hong Kong. If you are sensitive to flashing images, please close your eyes for about 15 seconds. Because we are going to talk about the Super Inframan. production. Is anybody familiar with Shaw Brothers, the major studio in Hong Kong in the 70s who produced almost every kung fu movie that got released over here? Um, they were huge. Uh, Run Run and, and his brother Hua basically uh, invented the kung fu genre as we know it. Um, they got, they had, uh, they gave Jackie Chan and Samuel Hung some of their early starts. Uh, their martial arts choreography was amazing. But anyway, because of the success of Japanese programs like Ultraman and Kamen Rider, Hong Kong really wanted in on some of that action and to combine it with their Kung Fu films. So um, they decided to hire uh, some Japanese guys from Ekisu Productions who had done a lot of the suits for Kamen Rider to create the suits and special effects for their movie. So they brought over a Japanese production team. And then they um, borrowed music from several Tsuburaya productions, like 
mirror man and ultra seven without asking because china had there is no there is no chinese term for copyright infringement <laughs> and the main character was played by hong kong actor danny lee who would later go on to be a major character in john who's the killer so the guy who played the cop in the killer played it for man this movie was a huge success they never made a sequel though because they just figured they couldn't the basic plot is the evil princess dragon mom has returned from her exile in the center of the earth and is determined to take over the world with her army of mutants only inframan a scientist who's been turned and motorcycle racer who's been turned into a cyborg can save the world shell brothers decided, hey, this worked out. Let's try our hands at other movies. But first, Roger Ebert said this about this movie. <laughs> Roger Ebert had a huge crush on this film. He thought it was the most entertaining film he saw in 1976. Just pure entertainment, not good, just entertaining. Now, the mighty Peking man came out in 1977. It's another Shaw Brothers production. This one was made to cash in on the remake of King Kong that came out in 1976 in the US. Now I usually wouldn't mention a King Kong knockoff as Tokusatsu, except for who did the effects for this film. The man himself. No, it's Koichi Kawakita, the guy who did all these special effects for the Heisei Godzilla series. This is his, some of his early work before he started working for Toho. Quentin Tarantino loves this movie. It was his first release on his Rolling Thunder Pictures Recut license label. I'm not entirely convinced they didn't actually kill somebody with a tiger to make this film. Hey, I'm Jan of the Jungle. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, for somebody who's raised in the jungle away from humanity, she really has nicely shaved legs and amazing hair. Yeah. So the basic plot of this one is they find a giant ape and they bring it to Hong Kong to show it off and it gets loose and attacks everything, climbs a building, gets shot and falls down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've heard that plot before. Jungle Girl? Jungle Girl is his best friend. They were raised together as children. By the way, I think this might be the German director with the subtitles. We'll get to Germany again later. Yeah, this isn't even trying not to be played in its rip-off status. Well, the world doesn't care about copyrights. So, however, this was not the worst King Kong knockoff, as you can see from the bottom there. APE, aka Attack of the Giant Horny Gorilla from South Korea. <laughs> this is a clip of that, and it's all I'm going to show you. garbage. <laughs> Entertaining garbage. Also, it was an American, Japan, uh, American South Korean co-production. All the American actors must have been actual soldiers they hired because none of them can act. It's like they're reading their scripts every time they're, they're acting. Except for one, the mom from Growing Pains is in that movie as an actress. And if you ever want to see the mom from Growing Pains naked, that's your movie. 
It's really awful. So, the Super Riders was an officially licensed Hong Kong for, uh, Taiwanese version of Jap Japan's Kamen Rider. Um, basically, they took all the footage from some of the Kamen Rider movies and replaced it with Taiwanese actors. And all of the old action scenes were dubbed over in Mandarin. I unfortunately do not have a clip of the Mandarin version. What I have is a clip of the German dubbed version of the Taiwanese adaptation of Kamen Rider, which has the best title I have ever seen. Frankenstein's Kung Fu Monster. <laughs> the reason for this is because when Toho released Frankenstein Conquers the World, if you've never seen that movie, it's really fun. The basic premise is Nazis had the heart of the Frankenstein monster, and as Berlin was falling, they transported it via submarine to a secret Japanese research facility in Hiroshima. You can see how this went bad. <laughs> the irradiated heart of the Frankenstein monster grows into a giant monster that fights a puppy dog dinosaur named Baragon. <laughs> From that point on, Every Godzilla and Gamera film got labeled as a Frankenstein movie with the excuse that Frankenstein was responsible for the creation of all of the giant monsters. This extended to this abomination. This is a clip of the German dub. <laughs> running copyright lawsuits in the history of Tokusatsu. Are there any, any? Yeah, Chayo Productions of Thailand is an interesting story. They were founded by a guy named Sampote, I'm not gonna try to pronounce his actual name, but he goes by Sampote Sands. He's made such movies on his own as The Magic Lizard, which is an amazingly inept film. Like, I wish I had clips of that, because it is so bad. Um, he also made a movie called uh, Crocodile, where a giant alligator attacks people in Thailand, but it's called Crocodile, and there are no alligators in Thailand, so it doesn't make any sense. But neither does his entire career path. Anyway, he got permission from Tsuburaya Productions in Japan to do some co-productions in the 1970s. That one right there is uh, Jumborg Ace and Giant. That one is the seven... Uh, Hanuman versus the Seven Ultramen. And that movie over there we'll get to later because that one's not authorized. <laughs> he did not have permission to use Kamen Rider at all. He just said, oh, fuck it. What are they gonna do, sue? Yes. <laughs> so he actually worked as an intern at Subaraya Productions in the 1960s, very, on a very limited basis. Um, he produced those movies I'm talking about. He then decided that 
Well, let's just show a clip of Hanuman in this verse of the Seven Ultimate. Hanuman is a mythological figure from Indian mythology that's spread with the spread of Buddhism. Um, he's kind of the monkey king, kind of an analog to Son Goku in China. In this movie, they recast the Ultraman as almost divine figures as opposed to aliens. And it, the, the Taiwanese version of this film, I mean, not Taiwanese, Thailand, the Thai version of this film is ridiculously bloody. So when they released it in, in Japan, there's like five minutes missing. I've got both versions. I don't sadly don't have any of them subtitled. But there's actually a scene where Hanuman picks up a guy and just goes, and blood goes squirt down out of his fist. In the Japanese version, he just picks the guy up. But this is one of the fight scenes. All the uniforms here are from Ultraman Taro from 1973. There's Hanuman dropping the ball. Needless to say, this film is not considered a camera in the Ultraman universe. So, okay, and then he made Hanuman versus the five Kamen Riders. In this scene, the Kamen Riders have all been defeated, and Hanuman is coming to resurrect them from the dead. You'll notice he dances a lot. So anyway, after the passing of Noburo Tsuburaya, who was the Eiji Tsuburaya's son, Mr. Sands decided he was going to produce a contract supposedly written by Noburo Tsuburaya saying that, well, because he was a major contributor to the creator creation of Ultraman, he had all the exclusive rights to the Ultraman franchise, the first six, outside of Japan. This contract had misspellings, episode uh, numbering wrong, and um, the official seal of Noburo Tsuburaya was forged, but it held up in court for years. Unfortunately, it also said that well, fortunately, it also said that they were not allowed to create any of their own Ultraman. They could only release the shows that they had, they supposedly had the rights to. They tried to create their own Ultraman, including that guy right there. But every time they did, Super Rise, like, the contract you supposedly have says you can't create derivative products. You can only release the stuff that you have the rights to. So they beat them down in court over and over again about that. And eventually, in 2018, a, they went to a neutral court in... Uh, Los Angeles, and they were like, this contract is garbage. 
This is so fake. This isn't worth the paper it's written on. No, you don't have any rights to Ultraman. You're done. And then they forced uh, Sampode Sans to pay damages to Subaraya. <laughs> so he's finally got the rights to all of his, the, the company finally has the rights to all of their own stuff back from this guy. We actually will be talking about this again later, because there's a major problem going on in China right now involving this. Now we move on to Indonesia and a show called Bima Satria Garuda. They've actually made a horror movie about it, which is pretty decent. Um, however, in this case, it's the it's the represent the hero basically gets the powers of a Garuda, and it's it's a pretty decent show. Um, it was heavily inspired by Kamen Rider Black and Black RX, which were hugely popular in Indonesia. Um, like it says, it's a co-production with Japan's Ishimori production. I love it because this is directed for the same guy who directed the original Gridman. Ultraman Tiga and Ultraman Dyna. The love interest in this film, in this thing, Stella Cornelia was a member of JKT48, the first non-Japanese affiliate group of AKB48. And they got a sequel in 2014 called uh, Sakri Garuda Bima X. I'm gonna show you a bit of a JKT48 video, just cause I had to do this. This is from their Halloween music video. It's just a tiny clip. Possibly. Um, they've actually performed with the AKB48 before in concert when they have a big meeting of all the different 48 groups from around Asia. So, I'll ask you that. I'll ask you that question here. <laughs> now we go to the People's Republic of China. Armor Hero is their attempt to make a Kamen Rider show. This is the English dub. I'm very sorry. Uh, 
I will say the suit designs are the best aspect of this entire show. We'll get to the problem with the show in a minute. That's like a good song. <laughs> No, they were shown in China and they were trying to market it outside of China. So you can actually watch this dubbed on YouTube if you really want to. The only problem with Chinese, with mainland Chinese tokusatsu, the fight scenes are really bad. The choreography is awful. Everything else looks great, but the choreography is garbage. It's too slow, it's too obvious they're not actually making contact. It's just not good. And it's really disappointing because everything else about these shows looks really fun. Then we get to the Battle Strike Team series. They wanted a Kamen Rider show, then they wanted a Super Sentai show. Sabres, I've seen the um, toys. Yeah, it's kind of fun in its own special way. Um, the first series was Giant Saber. The second one was Space Deleter, which I just love that title. <laughs> we delete space. <laughs> Can they clean up my house? And then the last one was Rescue Engine. Um, this is the OP to, Giant, to uh, Space Deleter. has the exact same flaw of really lackluster shows being created in China was they wanted their own tokusatsu so they wouldn't have anything to do with the Japanese ones because there is a really really strong anti-Japanese bias in China mm -hmm. um, it's kind of really awful that they created bad knockoffs because they didn't want to have to deal with the originals but that's what they got I mean there's nothing wrong with the costumes the costumes are great the uh, mecha designs are okay they're better in the first series than they are in Space Deleter, in my opinion. Space Deleter's a little bit boxy. Um, but the action scenes, you'd expect a Chinese production to have really great martial arts, but it doesn't. It's apparently only Hong Kong is good at that in China, and I don't know why. Although, admittedly, Taiwan is too, but I don't consider Taiwan to actually be part of China, which is why I can never visit China. <laughs> And then we get to this. Apparently, before the lawsuit was over, China decided that they were going to license a new Ultraman, uh, well, the character of Ultraman from that Thai, Thai guy, uh, Sampo T. Sands, and put him into a new series of CG animated films. Suburaya is suing the crap out of them for this at the moment. But unfortunately, it's really hard for a Japanese company to sue a Chinese company in mainland China. So they continue to produce these. This is the trailer for Dragon Force So Long Ultra Man. 
，一定要有我们人类自己的双手来保卫，而不是你一个外星人。It's produced by a company called Blue Ark Studios.、Um, they claim they got the rights from the Thai company, but the Thai company was like, "No, we never gave you the rights to do this." And even if they had, the lawsuit invalidates that. So to counteract that, Subaru has been putting all of their、um, Ultraman series dubbed in Mandarin on free online, so that Chinese students, people can watch actual Ultraman and know what it actually is. <laughs> They're like, "Here." Watch it. <laughs> know what the actual thing is. So we're going to go from copyright infringement to actual kidnapping now. <laughs> This is Pulgasari. Pulgasari is a North Korean Godzilla knockoff. <laughs> yes, it was actually produced by Kim Jong Il. <laughs> Kim Jong Il kidnaps South Korean. <laughs> Shin Sang Ok and his wife to make him movies. He actually kidnapped his wife first and then lured him into the country using his wife as bait. This is a horrible story. They forced him to make six movies, and the last one was this film. And even though Kim Jong Il hated the Japanese like you wouldn't believe, he hired Toho's special effects department to do the special effects for his Godzilla knockoff. And, and the guy in the suit. Is the guy who played Godzilla in the '90s?、Um, when the film was shown at a Vienna film festival, the director had played along so well. Kim Jong Il actually thought he brainwashed him and turned him into a loyal North Korean citizen. The minute him and his wife got to go to the Vienna film festival, they never showed up at the festival. Went to the American embassy, said, "We want to go home," and got sent back to South Korea. <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> They're like, "We are done making movies for this madman." Apparently, Kim Jong Il was a huge movie buff. He had hundreds of thousands of movies, and he was a big fan of monster movies and wanted to create one that would show the glory of North Korea. So he made this movie about a small monster figure made out of black rice by a blind man, and when he is murdered by evil authorities, his daughter bleeds on it, and it comes to life as a small metal-eating monster. The more metal it eats, the larger it gets. Until eventually, it eats and kills every one of the evil nobles,、um, folks,、uh, army. Then it turns on the citizens and demands that they feed it metal every day. So they have to give up all their plowshares and all of their stuff to feed this monster. And the only way to kill it is to get it to eat the person who animated it in the first place. So they hide the girl whose blood animated the monster inside of a bell and feed the monster the bell. And it eats its creator and dies. Somehow, this is supposed to be a metaphor for communism. I don't know how. Communists <laughs> are
watch this movie and not have to give any money to North Korea. It's entirely free to watch on YouTube. Very coordinated monster. <laughs> um, one of the weird things about this film is you can definitely tell which scenes were filmed by the Japanese film crew and which ones were filmed by the North Koreans. The film stock is even completely different. It's really jarring. Let's go to South Korea, a little bit nicer topic. Anybody watch the recent uh, MST3K reboot or new seasons? This is one of the movies they did in the first new season. Young Gari, Monster from the Deep. Now, a lot of people say this is a Godzilla knockoff. It's not. It was actually inspired by the Gamera series, which was way more popular in South Korea. Um, they hired the guys from Toei, who were known for later doing um, Super Sentai and Kamen Rider, to do the special effects for their movie which at the time was actually illegal under South Korean law to have anything to do with a Japanese company. Um, they made this movie about a giant monster that rises from a crevice in the earth, attacks South Korea, and is killed. Well, in the English version, it dies from terminal rectal bleeding after having ammonia dropped on its head in a really graphic scene that's really disturbing. In the original South Korean version, that just knocks it out and they load it on a rocket and shoot it in space. The South Korean happy ending was deleted from the American release. All we got was a monster bleeding out of its ass and twitching and dying. It's really sad for a movie that has a scene like this. This is young Gary dancing with a young boy. the movie, notice the buildings that get destroyed in the, in, when it attacks Seoul. Every building it attacks when it, it destroys when it attacks Seoul is a building that was built by the Japanese during the occupation. <laughs> all of the normal South buildings built by South Korea stay intact. Like all of their, their brilliant architecture is left, it left completely untouched. But all the blocky office buildings built by the occupation forces during World War II are gone. <laughs> they just get knocked over and destroyed. <laughs> So even when they're just making a fun movie, there's always a political statement. Now we move on to um, South Korea's Dispatch K-Cops. There's a lot of South Korean tokusatsu I can talk about, but I'm just going to go over some of the more recent examples. This one is Dispatch K-Cops. K-Cops is the story of two police. One of them is a, ro is a serious rookie who's really enthusiastic about getting into the job and, you know, just wants to do his best. And the other one is a jaded veteran who's kind of a slob and shows up to work late every day and doesn't really care because he's kind of of the opinion that people are garbage. But they're given powers by a space princess to protect her from an evil empire and have to become heroes. One of them is really enthusiastic about the idea. The other one's like, um, can I give these powers to somebody else? That's when I go home. <laughs> this is the OP to K-Cops. I love these suits. The villains are nuts. You can watch this entire series on YouTube, but unfortunately, it's not Okay, 
is the most recent uh, thing, but it's it's a lot of fun. Now we're gonna move on to a show called Legend Hero, and I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, Legend Hero is really good, entirely available on YouTube, and subtitled in English. This is basically South Korean Kamen Rider, but there's a major difference. This entire thing is inspired by the romance of the Three Kingdoms. Every character is named after a character from the romance of the Three Kingdoms. Which is sadly a book I am not entirely familiar with. I've played the video game, but I don't think that counts. This guy is a villain. They transform with these little things called heroes, and the heroes are what give them their names. They're these little chip things that are actually talking animated characters that wander around and do little chores for them and tell them to be heroes. They're really adorable. They put them in this bracelet and slap it together, and they become heroes. They've all been chosen by angels, as they call themselves, but we're not really sure if they're good or evil, to fight in a giant competition to decide who will win for some nebulous, amazing prize at the end. Sadly, I don't have the subtitles on this one. Our main hero is the dojo. He's actually supposed to be a student, but that guy was the number one student who was preventing him from actually learning anything. The girl who works there is his best friend. Not his love interest, because she thinks he's an absolute dork and doesn't want to have anything to do with him, aside from, you know, making sure he does his chores. She ends up getting a hero power in the third episode. She is the best character in the entire thing. I love her. Um, this show is just a lot of fun. Kind of serious at points, 
but the suit designs and the action are great. It combines the best of what we get from Japan with a nice story based on mythology from outside of Japan without having the problem of lackluster action like you got in the Chinese series. Now we're going to talk about Power Rangers, <laughs> but not American Power Rangers. In South Korea, for a very long time, um, they were releasing the Super Sentai series dubbed on VHS. They could not air it on TV because of rules against Japanese culture on, on South Korean television. However, when America created the Power Rangers, they aired it in South Korea the first couple of seasons. And then realized the acting was pretty bad. And the action wasn't what they wanted. So what they decided to do was bring the Japanese series over, dub it, and just call it Power Rangers. Brilliant. Um, such shows as Power Rangers Captain Force for uh, Gokaiger, um, Power Rangers, um, what was it? Oh, Power Rangers uh, Dino, well, this is actually the sequel to uh, what was Kyoryuger in Japan. Oh. They got to make an authorized sequel to the Japanese show. This is um, their, first, their completely authorized sequel. Every single character who is portrayed in here is from a K-pop group. <laughs> this is the OP. It is, you will see how, how obviously similar it is to the original Kyoryuger. Dino Force Brave. Basically, it's almost the same suits, but they painted parts of them white, and they changed the color on the weapons. And they slightly remodeled the, the, the robots that formed the giant robot. Um, these episodes are only 15 minutes each, though, as opposed to full 30 minutes, and it was only 12, uh, 13 episodes. However, it was big news. They even released it in Japan in a dub. I have both versions, the Korean and the Japanese version. I actually prefer the Korean version because the acting sounds better than the strange dub. Um, it's a really fun show and just shows that people can make really great versions of things that aren't from their country if they put their mind to it um, and just take inspiration and go with their own direction sometimes. Um, as long as there's some kind of passion behind it and a desire to do something with it, they can really make it work. Um, that is the problem with the Chinese series, is it feels like there's absolutely no passion behind it. It feels like this was created so we don't have to import the Japanese version. However, this was made in cooperation with the Japanese company as a sequel because the show was so popular. There was a, there was a demand for more among the fans. And it's a really, really fun show. If you ever get a chance to watch it, you know, I might actually show some of this tonight in the, the video room. Because it's just a lot of fun, and the characters are really likable. Um, so anyway, that's Tokusatsu outside of Japan. Uh, any questions? Oh, I have. So I was traveling to Korea earlier this year, and I picked up this action figure in the market, and he speaks Korean. Oh, awesome! It's, um... It's yeah, yeah, but he's speaking... That's awesome! Yeah. Yes, I can. That's great. But yeah, they were the kids' TV station was marathoning Common Rider X8 like the entire time I was there, dubbed in Korean, of course. And they had all the toys from it, redubbed in Korean. 
so. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big there. The funny thing is you can actually get the Korean toys for cheaper than the Japanese versions. That's how, um, well, this is kind of off topic, but that's how I got a lot of my Japanese Beast Wars toys was I bought the Korean versions because they were so much cheaper than the original Japanese ones. Same toy, it's just, you know, you know the instructions are in Korean. And I also noticed like a lot of the CG animated kid shows are really heavily Tokyo inspired. Yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to show any of those, but I've, I've seen a couple of them. It's great. I mean, and th there's lots of Japanese co-productions, especially when you're talking about CG animation. Um, this is way off topic, but it's a show I've been watching on Netflix. Does anybody want to watch Miraculous? Um, it's it's a it's a French Toei co-production about a super about a pair of superheroes in Paris, and it's really adorable. One of them transforms into a, a girl with a ladybug outfit, and the other one's in a cat outfit, and oh. it's just it's really cute. I actually got to watch it because I was babysitting a kid who was watching it, and I was like, wait, this looks like a Japanese show. And then the, tr the credits came up, and it was like, oh, it's French Japanese co-production dubbed into English, but all the text is left in French. This is cool. I've seen an anime actually in drunk and it's already done in anime. It looks better in anime form than CG. Yeah, there was an animated version of it too that I think that was released in Japan. And then there's, um, uh, so anyway, that's, that's Tokusatsu outside of Japan. Um, I hope you enjoyed the panel. I thought I hope you learned something and you saw some shows you might be interested in watching someday. I really do recommend uh, Legend Hero from South Korea and the South Korean um, Power, Power Rangers. Also, that first movie I showed the trailer for, Inferman, is one of the best movies you can watch if you just want something insanely fun and it's on Amazon Prime. I think it's the subtitled version, not the dub. Um, Lots of fun, great action, and everything explodes. Everything. Water explodes in that movie. <laughs> Arco Bay movie? Orgasm. Yes, except this has a plot. <laughs> and better action scenes that you can actually follow. But thank you for coming. I appreciate it.